السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله it's a, it's a great honor great pleasure to be here at MCC and to see the community is thriving full of energy vim and vigor may Allah preserve everyone preserve your families protect our youth elevate our elders and our esteem Walhamdulillah wa salat wa salam ala rasulillah. Unfortunately, I didn't get the memo about the Shaban talk. So I, I will, inshallah, talk a little about Shaban. Uh, but I'm going to talk about several things, in fact. I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, the first, I'm not going to repeat the talk that we gave at the Lighthouse. It was a very long talk, but I will start with the Black History Month, since this is February, and that's Black History Month. And as we said over there at the Lighthouse, uh, Black History Month wasn't given to the African-American community as a slight. You know, we'll give you guys the shortest month. <laughs> and we have Women's Month, March 31st days, and Black History Month get 28 days. but. Black History Month built on the, the legacy of Carter G. Woodson, the great African-American historian, second African-American to get a PhD from Harvard University after the great W.E.B. Du Bois. Carter G. Woodson famously wrote, amongst other works, The Miseducation of the Negro. In 1926, Carter G. Woodson started Black History Week. Black History Week was celebrated in the second week of February, not because February is the shortest month, but because February, the second week of February marks the birthday of Abraham Lincoln, February 12th, and the birthday of Frederick Douglass, February 14th. Hence, Black History Week in February, the second week of February. In 1970, after first conceiving of the idea of a Black History Month, African-American students and professors at Kent State University in Ohio, famously known for the Kent State Massacre, a protest against the Vietnam War was violently broken up, leading to the deaths of four students at Kent State in Ohio. That was Mar May 4th, 1970. That same year, a group of, as you mentioned, African-American professors and students on the campus of Kent State University came together and they initiated a Black History Month, and that began to spread. In 1976, Gerald Ford de designated uh, uh, February as a National Black History Month to celebrate the contributions of African Americans, and before America was America, the contributions of Africans uh, to the building of America. So, we just quickly want to segue from that into why is that relevant for us. As Muslims, conservative estimates say that 20% of the slaves who were brought to this country from Africa were Muslims. Some areas such as the coastal islands off the, islands off the coast of Georgia, the, Miss the Mississippi Delta area, uh, where rice was cultivated. Rice is a labor-intensive crop, so Plantation owners preserve, uh, preferred slaves who already knew how to grow rice. One of the gr rice growing areas in West Africa is the Senegambia River Delta. I was recently in Gambia, talk about that very quickly. And so that area is about 90% Muslim. And so slaves coming from that area were disproportionately Muslim. And so you find off the coast of Georgia, Louisiana Delta area, uh, Southern Virginia, you find a disproportionately in some areas up to 50% of the enslaved population were Muslims. Why is that relevant for you and me? It's relevant because those are our Muslim ancestors in this land. Because the ancestry is not an ancestry of blood. As we know, our Muslim ancestry is an ancestry that transcends blood. It's an ancestry that's built on faith and knowledge. Ibrahim is our father. Not many of us are direct blood descendants of Ibrahim, but he's our father. Millat Abikum Ibrahim, Khadija, Aisha, Radiallahu An, 
Huma, Um Salama, Juwayriya, Um Habiba, and the other uh, wives of the Prophet are our mothers, Ummahatul Mu'mineen. Most of us in here, probably the majority, are not descendants of the Arabs, yet those are our mothers. Would anyone disagree with that? No one disagree. Hence, it is a spiritual brotherhood and sisterhood that's relevant for us. The lineage is important. We're people that acknowledge our roots and our lineages, but our ultimate allegiance is based on our faith, and those are our brothers and sisters in faith. Many of them were scholars. It's documented. So may Allah give us tawfiq and tashir to, to really feel a part of that history and to feel that we're building on that history and to not feel that we are recent arrivals who have no roots here and not to start feeling unwelcome when people to start to talk about a Judeo-Christian America. They say, no, my Muslim ancestors, ancestors were here even before America was America. Ayyub bin Suleiman, Hafiz of Quran, a scholar who studied in Timbuktu, was here in 1731. His story, The Fortunate Slave, is the oldest extant work of African-American literature, a literary work about an African in the Americas, The Fortunate Slave, Job, Job bin Solomon, Ayyub bin Suleiman. So we won't go on this story. You can go to the lighthouse and Thing to archive that talk. But just to emphasize how important it is to acknowledge that history because in acknowledging that history, we immediately gain deep roots in this country. Roots that transcend uh, the, the 1960s when the immigration laws were changed and the doors were open for a mig migration of not large numbers of Muslims from the Arab countries and particularly from South Asia. The State Department is still looking for the one person who gave the first Pakistani a visa because he had two suitcases filled, filled with male and female Pakistanis and they were fruitful and they multiplied. May Allah give us tawfiq and taysir. And, and, but, and there, there are others, there are others. Uh, we can celebrate uh, those European American Muslims who, who are part of the early history of this country, such as William Bethune English. We can celebrate the life of uh, Alexander Russell Webb, who was the American ambassador to, to the Philippines, who accepted Islam owing to the influence of the Muslims from Mindanao and the Philippines and did incredible things once he returned to the States. We can celebrate that history. That's our history. We can celebrate those Syrians and Lebanese who went to Ross, South Dakota in the 1890s and built a masjid that's still there. It's been rebuilt. A beautiful little masjid, 92 square feet. If you ever go to visit in the middle of a, of a wheat field, that's our history of those Syrian and Lebanese in the 1930s who built the mother mosque in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Or those Albanian Muslims who built a, ma a masjid in 1909 in Lewiston, Maine. And then other Albanians who built a, a masjid in 1914 in Waterbury, Connecticut. That masjid still stands. It burned down in the 1940s. They rebuilt it. It's still there today. Or those Yemenis and Bengalis in the Central Valley here who came to help to, to cultivate and pick the crops to feed this country. And their presence so significant that many of them were, were instrumental in assisting Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta in the formation of the United Farm Workers Movement and the first Shahid of that movement. Because as the farm workers under the leadership of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta began to organize, the, the, there was a violent, uh, they met violent opposition from the, the, the farm owners, the farmers and landowners. And there were martyrs. And the first martyr of the United Farm Worker was a Yemeni Muslim, Naji Dayfullah. So this is our history as Muslims in this country. 
It's a rich history. It's a deep history. It's a, and it's a history that bring us, brings us all together. And as we come together now, and uh, just to conclude this part of the talk, Many, if we talk about in the African-American context, the largest kind of proto-pseudo-Muslim movement was the Nation of Islam. The members of the Nation of Islam, they refer to the period of Elijah Muhammad until the leadership of Imam Warathuddin Muhammad as the first resurrection, where what they were taught wasn't really Islam. It was a lot of psychological upliftment, uh, identity, building a positive ident uh, identity. And so this was the first resurrection. And the second resurrection, Imam Warthi D. Muhammad, in, in a, 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 phenom a, a, a development that is tremendously understudied. There should be myriad PhDs <clears throat> on the work of Imam Warthi D. Muhammad. Because if we can accept that what the nation of Islam was teaching was not Islam. That uh, W.D. Farrar or Fard Muhammad appeared as a law in Detroit, Michigan in 1930 to bring Islam to the black man in America. That doesn't sound like Islamic belief. Or, or that and, and Elijah Muhammad was the messenger of Allah to the black man in America after the Prophet Sallallahu that it had its place. I'm not trying to, as the young people might say, hate on the nation of Islam. I'm trying to make a point. And that point is, and uh, you know, the, the white race was grafted on the island of Patmos in the Mediterranean Sea by a big head black doctor named Dr. Yaqub. So if you can accept that's not Islam per se, then Imam Warthadi Muhammad bring half a million people out of that movement into Islam. And uh, the Nation of Islam, uh, our fast is December because the days are short and cool. So it's a baby fast for a baby nation. Imam Warthadi Muhammad brought the members of that, many of them, half a million into fasting Ramadan, half a million into La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, half a million from praying like facing the east and praying like this, to putting their head on the ground and making prostration to Allah five times a day, the salah as we know it, make a change in the pilgrimage from Chicago, Illinois, to attend Savior's Day, to going to Mecca, so Imam Warathuddin Muhammad, in my estimation, orchestrated the greatest single act of mass conversion in human history within a couple of years. That's part of our history, and that's something we should, we should study and try to understand how did he do that. Underappreciated. And so that period coming out of the teachings, the old teachings, the first resurrection to the leadership of Imam Warathim, Muhammad, the second resurrection into a proper Islam, but still with an emphasis on the uplift and development of the African-American community. And now something that uh, members of that movement, something Jackson, uh, Dr. Sherman Jackson highlighted in his book, Islam and the black America awaiting the third resurrection. The third resurrection <clears throat> is when this entire community, what you see represented here, acknowledges and plugs into those roots and then brings the full fruition of Islam to our people in this country. That's the third resurrection. And we can no longer say we're awaiting the third resurrection. The third resurrection is here. But now we have to organize it. And we have to focus it. And we have to bring it to the people. We cannot, we cannot in good faith, complain about how lost people are. We cannot complain in good faith about how asleep people who claim to be woke are. We cannot in good faith uh, complain about all of the nonsense and foolishness that we see happening 
if we're not out there trying to guide the people and direct the people and show the people there's a better way to live. That they don't have to be watch this country being polarized along racial lines. Not to deny the progress made in that regard, but progress can be quickly undone. I've been recent, reading recently the trilogy of Dr. Richard Evans. Dr. Richard Evans has written what many consider the definitive uh, history of the Third Reich, Hitler's Germany. The trilogy, the coming of the Third Reich, the Third Reich in power, the Third Reich at war. And the quickness with which the German people le le led down the path to madness, the way that uh, national sentiments were exploited in the light of legitimate grievances, the, the harsh measures that were imposed on the German people after their defeat in the First World War. But how that, how that happened and how quickly it happened is illustrative for us. It shows that if it happened once, it could happen again. If someone said in 1930 that 10 years from now, Germany would be on a path, would have initiated a war, and would soon be on the path of a war on two fronts, that they would kill 25 million civilians, including the six million Jews, in the most horrific ways, undeniably. And the most horrific ways. Some of us, they would say, you're crazy. That can never happen. But it did happen. And so we, as Muslims, should understand it could happen. But we have a solution. And not because I say we have a solution. Some of the greatest minds in human history say we have a solution to the race problem. And I don't personally, I'm, I'm, I don't want to hear people saying, we're, well, we have racism in our community. We, we have problems. We have problems. We don't have hardcore racism. Hardcore racism is when you sell your house if someone the wrong color moves next door. Hardcore racism makes the cemetery the most segregated neighborhood in America. Because if a black man is buried in a white cemetery, that cemetery is going to go out of business. Because white folks aren't going to want to bury their, their deceased there. Well, Allah give us tawfiq. Hardcore racism is where people ignore the danger or the, the damage that was done by the Third Reich. And they openly espouse neo-Nazi movements. And they call their publications the Stormer after the, the SS, which was the, the, the most genocidal wing of the Nazi party personally responsible not just for the Holocaust, but for the massacre of millions of Russian prisoners of war. And they named their publications, and they have the crooked S of the double S of the SS, and they have websites, and they're gaining adherence. Arnold Toynbee said in his book, Civilization on Trial, a chapter dedicated to Islam the West and the future. Islam has a solution to the West race problem in the West. Because at the end of the day, it's a largely Western phenomenon, not to deny color consciousness and other things that have existed in other societies. But the whole idea of race itself, as we contemporarily understand it, is a European phenomenon, a European invention that's less than two centuries old. So Arnold Toynbee said Islam, one of its distinguishing features is its ability to get human beings to rise above racial consciousness. And then he said the problem of alcoholism, by extension, drugs and opiates and opiates and opium. La ilaha illallah. So at a time we see racism 
in many, many quarters resurgent. And not just uh, white racism, we see black racism. We see theories that say all white people are, are inevitably racist, incurably racist. That's not the Quran. That if you're in this group, you enjoy privilege just because of the color of your skin. That's not Islam. Islam tells us what that wa No bearer of burdens can bear the burden of another. You're an individual, you're going to be judged as an individual, not as a member of a group. Because when we, we make group identity something that's inevitable and escapable, we get into all sorts of absurdities. We we say that. Some coal miner in Appalachia who lost his son in the Iraq war because he couldn't get a job. The guy was 50 years old. His life was done. He had black lung disease and his back bent out from stooping over for 30 years in a coal shaft and black lung from breathing coal dust. And he ended up on with an a overprescribed opiate on OxyContin because that company was marketing to these areas and then prescribing for the whole family. And then when he died a premature death and his prescription expired, his wife who was strung out on the OxyContin, now she had to go to get and start buying heroin because the prescription expired. And their son died in Iraq and their wife has two babies from two different guys and she's an alcoholic. And then someone comes and says, you enjoy white privilege. That's an absurdity. And tell Robert Johnson, who made $3 billion selling BET to MTV, African-American, paid off the tuition for the entire senior class of Morehouse College a few years back, that he's oppressed because he's African-American. It's an absurdity. No bearer of burdens can bear the burden of another. Everyone will come to Allah farda, as an individual for judgment. We have to be have confidence in what we believe. I was mo I was almost moved to tears. I was recently at Georgetown Law School, and the young lady was moderating hijab, Muslim sister. Every word of her out of her mouth was like it, it was a a, a a a scripted advertisement for wokeness. You know, we have Muslims, we have to stand up for social justice because the intersectionality dictates that our allyship naturally lies with other uh, uh, marginalized, oppressed people. And it was, it was like I couldn't believe my ears. And the saddest part for me, the saddest part is why would someone jump on a bandwagon of an intellectual fad? If you're here and you don't think it's an intellectual fad, then I would challenge your thinking. Because 10 years ago, to be safe, 15 years ago, there wasn't a single Muslim on the face of this earth who was using that language. Tell me if I'm wrong. There wasn't a single Muslim on the face of this earth using that language. And I guarantee you, 20 years from now, there won't be a single Muslim on the face of this earth using that language. If that's not an intellectual fact, I don't know what's it, what is. But the danger, the danger is that language informs our worldview. Language informs how we see the world. The, the Quran ushered in by canonizing the Arabic language, an ancient tongue. It defined how Muslims see the world. We see the world in categories that are predicated on the centrality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That language of privilege and hegemony and toxic masculinity and intersectionality and marginalized oppressed groups. There ain't a law. Where's the law in all that? It's a secularizing of the mind. And when the mind is secularized, Allah is systematically removed from the equation. And so people will say that this or that or other we should be advocating for with no consideration 
Is it haram or is it halal? When Allah is at the center of our consciousness, that's the first question we ask. Is it halal or is it haram? When Allah has systematically been removed from the equation, we don't ask about is it halal or is it haram? Is it liberating or is it oppressing? It does it elevate and exalt and ultimately deify the individual self? Or does it affirm that the only deity in creation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It deifies the self and systematically removes Allah from the equation and make any calculation of haram and halal irrelevant for us. And it also does something even more insidious. It reduces the parameters of our or confines the parameters of our thought to this world. And so the quest for justice becomes a zero-sum proposition. Because if I don't get it in this world, I don't have it because there is no world to come. And we shouldn't expect that there's a world to come when every single theorist that one who might use that language quotes is an atheist. Every single one. Foucault is an atheist. Leotard is an atheist. Marcuse is an atheist. John Paul Sartre is an atheist. The entire Frankfurt School, Ordorno, and Max Horkheimer, Gramsci, they're all atheists. Marx is an atheist. Lenin is an atheist. Judith Butler is an atheist. So you're talking about men? Need some women. Judith Butler is an atheist. They're all atheists. How is an atheist going to bequeath unto a believer a worldview that accommodates Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter? It's not going to happen. And because it's not going to happen, we have Muslims running around here talking about social justice. I don't deny social justice. But why not just plain justice? What happened to just plain justice? Why just social justice? Because if we talk about just plain justice, we have to talk about justice in our relationship to Allah subhanahu with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are we an unjust in our relationship to Allah? In the shirk al-vulman azim, you talk about oppression, shirk is the great oppression. And when we idolize ourselves, we're engaging in a form of shirk. And liberalism, which is the ideological foundation of all of this stuff, idolizes the self. What was one of their slogans at the beginning of the 20th century? I am the captain of my ship, the master of my fate. Not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the messenger of Allah, of Allah. I am the master of my fate, the captain of my ship. Your ship is the Titanic and it just hit the iceberg. Now what? So we have to think, my brothers and sisters, social justice. What about just plain justice? I like to use to illustrate this point the hadith. Of Abi Dhar Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Qala, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ittaqi la haythu ma kunt. Wa atbi sayyat al-hasna tamhuha. Wa khalik al-nas bi quluk al-hasn. Be mindful of Allah wherever you are. And any misdeed you do, follow it up with a good deed. Being weightier in terms of its reward will wipe it out. And treat people on the basis of good character. Wa khalik al-nas bi there's your complete picture of justice. Justice in our relationship with Allah, as we said. Being mindful of Allah's commandments and prohibitions. And understand being mindful of the primacy of Tawheed. And when we violate Tawheed, and when we violate the prohibitions and commandments, we're oppressors. And the greatest oppression is shirk. In the shirk ala vulmun azim, not because I said it. And I'm trying to convince you to embrace my theory of how the world works. This is Quran. Tawbah. 
Whoever doesn't repent, they are the oppressors. So people think they can sin with impunity and just because they're advocates of social justice, they're in like Flynn. It doesn't work like that. Because those two realms of justice define what's valid in the realm of social justice, which is the third. There are people in the social realm on the basis of good character. Be just with them. Be merciful to them. And so it's a system. We can't just dismiss those two, which the atheist dismisses because there is no Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no God to worry about shirk and idolatry and kufr. There is no soul. We're all this, this. We're all material. What we might identify as the functions of the soul for them, they're just neurological processes waiting for us to, to discover them. And that's why their pet science is neuroscience. Oh, we'll find out about all this stuff and these mysteries. It won't be deja vu all, all over again once we figure it out. <laughs> May Allah give us tawfiq and taysir. But we have a worldview. And so from here, we can move. And so when we dismiss the hereafter, we know that ultimate justice is in the hereafter. Any theory that puts forth and advances and advocates that there's going to be perfect justice here, they're deluding you. They're deceiving you. That's why so many people get depressed. They find out that as time goes on, sometimes justice is a long time coming. As Dr. King said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But the bending in the context of the universe, it takes a long time. We've been struggling, we've been sacrificing and working, and many of us, we haven't seen justice. But it will come if Allah wills. And if it doesn't come in this world, it will definitely be established in the hereafter. And there it will be perfect. But if you remove the hereafter, you don't have any hope. And you see people despairing. You see Muslims despairing. And that's not a characteristic of a believer. <inaudible> Only a disbelieving people despair of Allah's mercy. But if you don't believe in Allah, either in a real sense or in a de facto sense, because one's mind and thought process has been secularized, then it's going to be, this world is going to be a very depressing place. We had the earthquake in Turkey. And like the tsunami in 2000, December 2004, the hardest hit area was Aceh. Aceh is the most religious uh, part of Indonesia. A sister, Dian Elian, is there. By the grace of Allah, I got to spend 10 days, at, two days rather, at her orphan in, in Wijda, in, uh, near the uh, Moroccan Algerian border, in this past January. Beautiful organization, wonderful. It's all girls, young ladies there. MashaAllah, dedicated staff, beautiful facility. May Allah preserve them. Allahumma salli rasulillah. Where was I? I went on that tangent, testing all of you. Huh? Yes, thank you. So the tsunami struck. People in the West were, were saying, you know, Christians were apostating. Where's God's mercy? Look at this terrible occurrence. Earthquake in Turkey is terrible. Where's, where's the merciful God? What's the believer saying? Alhamdulillah. Everyone who died, they're a martyr. As shuhada wa khamsa, al mat'un, mat'un, wal mabtun, wal gharik, wa sahib al hadmi, wa shahidu fi sabili la. The one who dies in a demolished structure. 4 a.m. in the morning, sleep. Most of those people perished, they were asleep. Never knew what happened. And some were injured and they suffered. What, how does the believer see suffering? Nothing afflicts the believer, even a pricking of a thorn, except some of their sins are expiated because of that. And the martyr goes to Jannah. Fast track. 
or easy pass, whatever it is. I get confused. Bipost, bicoastal. Some people, some bipolar. I don't know. Easy pass, fast track, straight to Jannah. There's Allah's mercy. Khalidina fiha abada, dwelling there and forever. There's Allah's mercy. Those who suffered and wounded, sins expiated. There's Allah's mercy. But if we don't believe in the hereafter, if we don't believe that there's a God, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can wipe away our sins, if we don't even believe in the concept of sin, then where's the foundation for us really understanding at a deep level Allah ta'ala's mercy? The ability to sacrifice. If we uh, uh, deify ourselves, it becomes very difficult to sacrifice for others. We wonder why it's so difficult to get married when everyone's deifying themselves. Anna, Anna, Anna. Afara'ita man attakhada ilahahu hawahu wa addallahu allahu ala ilmin wa khatam ala sam'ihi wa qabba ala sam'ihi wa qalbihi wa ila akhir al-ayah have you not? None. وَجَعَلَ بَصَرِ غِشَاوَةً فَمَنْ يَهْدِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ اللَّهِ أَفَلَا تَعْكِلُونَ أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ So, have you not seen the one that takes their very whims as their God? People worshiping their whims themselves. If everyone's worshiping themselves, What's the foundation for sacrificing for others? But if we're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we understand the sacrifices we make for others are rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sacrifices we make for others, for others, are a, a source of enhancing our standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sacrifices we make for others Make for other the foundation for building a strong society. But if we're worshiping ourselves and glorifying ourselves and aggrandizing ourselves, there's no foundation for those sacrifices for others. And what happens to our society and our social bonds? Exactly what we see happening. When we see everything as progress, and only the only good in human society lies in progress, then we devalue the past. And in devaluing the past, we reject the spiritual foundations that those who preceded us have built. And that energy is very important for pushing us forward, further down the road of history. I truly believe that it, the, the, the prayers that were made by those uh, Muslims who preceded us who were being exploited and their blood, sweat, and tears built this country for free labor, that they prayed that one day there will be Muslims here who will be able to do something they couldn't do. They could worship, they could pray if they had the strength but they couldn't build an MCC. They couldn't build the, the, the schools and the madaris. They couldn't build a Masjid al Huda. They couldn't build Quran schools. They had Mus'haf circulating. That's documented. But they couldn't build institutions. And because they couldn't build institutions, they could not establish the foundation of knowledge that is the bedrock of this community. As the great Orientalist Franz Rosenthal in his book, Knowledge Triumphant, Islam is the only knowledge-based society, uh, civilization in human history. So unlike other civilizations, the Chinese civilization, Confucian civilization is not found outside of China, just rare pockets. The civilization of the Buddhists isn't found outside of South Asia and Southeast Asia. The Nilotic civilization of Kush and then Nubia and then Egypt is not found outside of the Nile really va river valley. 
The Mayans aren't found outside of the Yucatan Peninsula. The Incas aren't, aren't found outside of the Andes Mountains, primarily in Peru. The Aztecs aren't found outside of central Mexico. All the civilizations, they're localized, either based on geography or based on tribe or clan. Islam had a civilizational flourishing amongst the Arabs. It has civilizational flourishing amongst the Persians, a civilizational flour flourishing amongst the Turks, a civilizational flourishing amongst the Africans. Great civilization, the wealthiest civilizations in, in the world at their time. We all know about Mansa Musa's Golden Hajj, the greatest university and centers of learning at Timbuktu, and other and Jine and Gao and other centers of learning and commerce and civilization in the, amongst the Europeans in Andalusia, in the Balkans. Why? Because it's not based on race. It's not based on geography. It's based on knowledge. And when that knowledge comes to this country, as it is, we see our young people learning the Quran, learning the, the Arabic language, the foundations of that civilization. There was a time when I first converted to Islam, Ramadan came, everyone was scrambling to go to the Egyptian embassy or the Pakistani embassy to get a hafiz to come over to lead the Tarawih prayer. Now most masses, they're three or four, five, six, seven, eight, some places, ten uh, of the Shabab who can lead the Tarawih. Our sisters meeting in their houses and sisters leading their sisters in Tarawih prayer in their homes. La ilaha illallah is happening, brothers and sisters. We have to have eyes to see it and to appreciate it. And this leads us to Shaban, which leads us to Ramadan. It's time to fast. It's time for us to minimize the, the, the influence that the physical has over us and to bring to the, to the fore the spiritual. And we do that through the Qur'an, we do that through the fasting. We do that through missing sleep. And that's part of the process. Don't refuse to come to Tarawih because you're going to miss two hours of sleep. That's part of the process. Don't fail to eat the pre-dawn meal because you're going to sleep to 20 minutes before Fajr goes out so you can get two hours of extra sleep. Missing sleep is part of the process. Imam Ibrahim al nakhai rahimahullah, he said, Halaka man halaka qablukum bi thalathi khisal, fudulul ta'am wa fudulul kalam wa fudulul manam. The people were ruined before you were ruined because of three characteristics, too much eating, too much sleeping, and too much talking. Ramadan cuts down on all three. If we're staying for tarawih and we're getting up for suhoor, we're sleeping less. Naturally, we're fasting, we're eating less. And we're so tired, towards the latter part of the day, we're talking less. We, we start monitoring the call, call ID. And uh, this is gonna have to wait until after iftar. And then we know the etiquette of the, the fast in terms of controlling our tongues. And to, to, to end where I began and talking about those African slaves, don't use the excuse, I'm working, I can't fast. You're getting out of your air-conditioned house to your air-conditioned car. It's winter now, so you don't need the air-conditioned. But you know what I'm saying. And going to your air-conditioned office, I'm working, I can't fast. But dear brothers and sisters, Slaves, many of those slaves, they're documented by the likes of Dr. Sylvia and Diouf, Michael Gomez, and others. Dr. Michael Gomez. They were fasting, many of them, on a starvation diet. A slave was systematically starved to death. The working life of a slave, average slave, was 14 years. And the master wanted them to drop dead after 14 years. So you, you literally had them on a near starvation, enough energy to work, but not enough to be healthy after 10 or 12 years of slave labor. 
and they didn't want old people around. Mention in the lighthouse, 80%, 80 cent out of every healthcare dollar goes to take care of the elderly. So if slave masters have to care for a bunch of old slaves and they can't work any longer to feed them and clothe them and shelter them, that's a big chunk of their profits. So they didn't want old slaves around. But on that starvation diet, being worked to death, our brothers and sisters were fasting. And so as we approach Ramadan, let us approach it in that spirit, that I'm going to fast. I'm going to do this. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to miss sleep. I'm going to attend the tarawih prayer. I'm not making excuses because I work, even physical labor, I'm not going to fast. Now, if your health is jeopardized and compromised, break your fast. Don't, don't let me be the excuse for you meeting Allah Ta'ala earlier than you already would. But you know what I'm saying. We know when we're making excuses where there is no excuse. So may Allah bless us in Ramadan. May Allah Ta'ala bless us to, to have that spirit of appreciation. May Allah Ta'ala bless us to have that spirit of resistance. Say the first thing Kunta Kente did, and I was in Gambia. I went to Kunta Kente's village. I went to his Quran school. Like the hint that Kunta Kente was a, a Muslim. The new root starts with the Adhan. But they don't say he was probably Hafiz of Quran. Like all the young Mandinka boys in that part of the world, they go to the, the Kutab, they go to the Quran school. They're still learning from the law. And those laws, they last a long time. How long can a law last, Qadr Amr? Being treated in 100 years? Yani, 200 years. Wallahu alam. But when I was there, I was just imagining, you know, maybe one of these young boys or young girls, the boys and girls, they're all in there together. Maybe one of them is holding Kunta Kinte's law. But they're definitely going through the same process he went through. And looking at that, this is like the third conclusion, but when we talk about jumping on intellectual band, bandwagons, those who do that, bitsal of wali mean a badalat. What a, a terrible exchange. That's oppression. Bitsal of wali mean a badalat. Because we have something that transcends. Islam is not a fad. Islam is a transcendent historical reality. And that was reinforced for me when I was in that village. And the, the sheikh is just casually leaning up on the wall. He has his switch. Tap the, the kids and they're learning their Quran. That Quran school and Islam the masjid, it's all still there. It was there before slavery. It was there during slavery. It was there during colonization. It was there during liberation. And it's there now. And inshallah, when everyone there is gone, it will still be there. Islam is a transcendent, ongoing, deeply rooted historical reality. And the, the challenge for us, my dear brothers and sisters, is to ask ourselves honestly and truthfully, do I want to be part of that progression of, of, of faith and spirituality and knowledge? Do I want to be part of that going all the way back to the Prophet wasallam and extending into our time or do I want to, to, to neglect it for something passing and temporal? That's the question we should ask. And if we choose to, to get off that train and jump on some passing bandwagon, we should understand Allah doesn't need us. Allah doesn't need any of us. We mentioned today in Juma, Allah Ta'ala saying, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, addressing us. The believers, 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا من يرتد منكم عن دينه فسوف يأتي الله بقوم يحبهم يحبون Oh you who believe if any of you turns back and usually the first thing the exegetes mention they mention other things من تولى عن نصرة دينه If you turn back from assisting, helping, strengthening this, this religion Allah will bring another people whom he will love and they will love him. If we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our heads and hearts are swayed by some atheist. If we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our heads and hearts aren't, aren't swerved and deviated by people who have, are hell-bent on destroying this religion on destroying the family that la the, the social bedrock of the religion they all tell you judith butler tells you they all tell you black lives matter which were formed by three, three queer women to disrupt the patriarchal hetero heterosexual normalcy to disrupt to dismantle to destroy allah doesn't need us Allah doesn't need us. وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِلَ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُ أَمْثَالَكُمْ If you turn back, Allah will, Allah will bring another people. They won't be like you. And Allah is bringing those people. And their hearts are filled with the light of faith. And they're impacting this world. So brothers and sisters, we have a job to do. And may Allah bless us to come together. May Allah bless our leadership to provide the blueprints to bring us together so that we can go forth and bring in and usher in the full force of that third revelation and save this country at a time where there are many forces threatened, threatening its continued existence. May Allah bless all of you. Give you tawfiq, taysir, kabul. May Allah keep light in your heart and a smile on your face. La tahqiranna min al-ma'rufi shay'a wala an talqa akhaka bewitchin tadiq. Don't be mean the smallest amount of good that you can do even if it's meeting your brother or your sister with a pleasant face. May your faces be pleasant May your hearts be filled with light. May, may we steal ourselves and prepare ourselves for the work ahead. May we let, take this religious seriously. This is not a joke. This is serious business. And the people are spending billions of dollars to turn us away from it. They know and recognize it's serious business. Sometimes we don't, but they do. May Allah give us tawfiq. May Allah bless all of you. Bless our sisters. Bless our brothers. Bless this wonderful center. Bless our students. Bless our imams and leaders and shuyukh. May Allah bless everybody. Bless, bless us to really enjoy and appreciate the great honor that we've been given to hold aloft the banner of tawheed. Alhamdulillah. وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا وكرة عيوننا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. السلام عليكم. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله. Thanks for coming out to MCC again. Would you be able to indulge us with some questions? أهلا وسهلا ومرحبا. And comments. And comments, of course, yes. So we raise your hands, sisters. Let's do sisters first. And then. Very erudite people. Is that really? Yeah. And then we'll do brothers after. Let's do sisters first. Just raise your hand. We'll have the mic come to you. Shy group. We have questions online if nobody wants to. Or comments. Or comments. Yeah. Oh my God. The people freely, you know. Freely. We got the Exchange. people's imam here. There we go. Yep, got it. Sister Liz. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali Sayyidina Muhammad. 
Mashallah, I was just uh, struck by your suggestion that there should be more PhDs done on um, Imam Waratin. Absolutely. Muhammad, and um, it just, just struck me that um, the kindergartners <laughs> need books too. And um, I'm sure in your all your studies, maybe you have um, like a long list of beautiful places um, that a, a story writer could go to, you know, like histories to bring out in children's books. Uh, the seer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you, you could write just a, 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 a children's book on the stories of the Prophet's interaction with children Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the various companions the children amongst the companions the, and then from every epoch brothers and sisters every era you could, uh, you you could do the stories from every region, just the Muslim folk stories, in in every part of this ummah. So, that that is a, a treasure, and a gift that will keep on giving, for a very 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 long time, inshallah. And so it's just going into those histories, going into the sirah, going into the history, going into the biography. Going into biographical dictionaries, uh, uh, one of the uh, scholars at uh, Columbia University, Richard Bullitt, went into the biographical dictionaries, the tabaqat literature, to, to see how Islam actually spread amongst people. So in this first generation, who accepted Islam and how was Islam practiced in the second and the third? And he, so he went into, into that literature and he found just amazing things. He wrote, uh, wrote a book documenting that Islam, the view from the edge. We could go into that same literature and mind, look at who, who are the children and what are their stories and their biographies, etc., and just mine from that uh, the things that we need to tell the stories, the, the stories of children in the Qur'an. So there's, there's an incredible wealth I mean, of history. I was uh, really focusing on the African-American history in the U.S. because I uh, it's really hard to find um, stories about Muslim African-Americans. But children are just... For children's stories. For yeah. children's stories. You could look at the lives of the, the Muslims who were here during the Spanish era and their incredible stories including out, out in West, the Western part of the, this United States, uh, those Muslims who uh, were killed for propagating Islam. You could tell that in a nice way to kids, to children, <laughs> in the context of sacrifice and what it means. The children have to be introduced to the reality of the world in a way that's appropriate for them. Then during British colonization, the likes of, we mentioned Ayub bin Suleiman, and after... The America, the United States were formed, Ibrahim Abdurrahman, Prince, uh, Omar bin Said, Muhammad Baquba. There, there comes a whim, Sylvian de Youth. I haven't read it yet because it's, it's almost out or it just came out. Sylvian de Youth just finished a book of uh, uh, women amongst the enslaved population. So we know the story of uh, Amina too, who recorded the names in the book of the Negroes when uh, New York was about to fall to the American rebels. That's what they were at the time. The American rebels and the, the American rebels have promised to send those uh, uh, escaped slaves back to the South. So the British uh, brought them to Canada and they recorded their names in a log that became known as the book of the Negroes. And the, there was a Muslim woman uh, Amina too, who was the scribe recording the names in the book of the Negroes. And like I said, Sylvian de Youf is just finishing or recently finished a book on uh, Muslim women amongst the slave population. So you could go into the likes of that book and you can bring forth incredible stories. Uh, Mother Teresa was the wife of uh, Sheikh Dawood Faisal in New York City in the late 30s, 40s, 50s, into the 60s. And uh, Sheikh Daoud gave dawah to Malcolm X. 
you could Google and see, just go to Google Images, Malcolm X, and that will shake that old face on. You could see Malcolm listening very intently to what Sheikh Daoud is saying to him. Uh, so, but his wife, Mother Teresa, you study her story, you'll find amazing things. But people are starting to die. We have to, uh, some of our students want to be do meaningful dissertations, go to New York, go to Brooklyn, and, and talk to some of those old timers who are still around, and get the stories of Sheikh Daoud and the stories of of um, Mother Khadija, I was saying Mother Teresa, Mother Khadija, and get that recorded. And there are a lot of uh, uh, incredible souls uh, who, whose stories, you could write a children's book on, on the life and career of Dr. Fatima Jackson, who got her PhD at UC Berkeley, world-class uh, geneticist. She was chair of the African American Studies Department, uh, her career primarily University of Maryland. She taught at Howard. She was the chair of the African American Studies at uh, North U UNC, North, North Carolina, Carolina Chapel Hill. Her, all of her children have PhDs, like five or six children, they all have PhDs. She started a school where she had professors from local universities teaching at a, a, a for lack of a better word, a storefront high school for for young African American males being being taught by pro bono by professors from University of Maryland and Howard, et cetera. So that story alone would would be so incredible. So just use your imagination. Yes, sir. Wa'alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, sir. his work out. Bismillah. Uh, Imam Zaid, this, this does, you're mentioning something that's been just puzzling me. Somebody who grew up in a very liberal area uh, and, uh, you know, very hippie kind of neighborhood, for lack of a better term. What kind of neighborhood? A uh, hippie. Hippie. Hippies, pot smoking hippies, you know. All, all, you, all <laughs> and, you were saying is give peace a chance. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, love, peace, and happiness. And, it, and some, a lot of it resonated for me, at least, you know, the peacefulness. You didn't smoke any hippie grass. I was the only one that didn't. Take me. To what, yeah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I was offered it many times. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that's how where I grew up. And then. And then even you look in politics, there's the, you know, on the left, there's, you know, anti, there's, at least there's anti-racism, trying to, you know, the argument for equality. And then on the right, there's racism, but then there's, there's, a, there's a focus on religi religiosity, whereas on the left, it's like anti-religiosity. Where, how, like in the United States, it almost seems like they're split, like perfectly split and split in such a, I would be like, shape. You know, uh, devilish way that you can't. Find well, I would I would say we have to look beyond the labels. I, I would challenge the premise of uh, anti-racism on the left. California is the most the most left-leaning state in the union. It has the largest prison population. If it were an independent nation, it would have the third largest prison population on earth, and the overwhelming majority of those incarcerated individual are African American or Latino and African American and native. And so that's California. You know, we have some of the most segregated neighborhoods. And, and so I, I and 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 uh, we have some of the, the most segregated schools in terms of their performances. Like if you're uh, Abdul Haq, what's the dropout rate for in Oakland compared to somewhere like San Ramon or Pleasanton? Night and day in California, liberal California. So, you know, I, I would challenge just the basic premise of that question. But I think as Muslims... Ostensibly. The, yeah, yeah. The image That's what I was going to say. Saying, yeah. let's, but let's take it, yeah. uh, Yanni, for the sake of argument. We have, to, we have to form our own political agenda and shop that between the parties as opposed to 
being bought and sold and pimped by the political parties. We, we have to have an independence based on our vision. And then if the, re, if the Democrats are going to meet us here, then we'll, we'll do business on this issue with the Democrats. And if Republicans are going to meet us there, we'll do business with the Republicans. But this whole idea of sort of the, the whole political question being, we use the term once, I'll use it again, a, a zero-sum proposition where it's all with the Democrats, yeah. or all with the Republicans, mm -hmm. and there's no third choice. There is a third choice. And we should begin to position ourselves as the third choice and invite people to jump on our bandwagon. But we have to have confidence in ourselves as a community. And that leads to something Malcolm was emphasized greatly, that if, if, you, if we confine ourselves as Muslims and turn both at the level of consciousness, that uh, my awareness of what it means to be a Muslim is confined to the boundaries of the United States, or in terms of our membership in a global community, then we're going to be weak and we're going to perceive ourselves as being weak and we're going to be insecure and that weakness, perception of weakness and that insecurity will lead us to making the kind of political compromises we're making. But we're part of an ummah. We're part of an ummah. And we have to see ourselves as such. And when we see ourselves as such, then we can not only begin to formulate our own programs that a lot of Republicans who might see the same kind of situation you described or Democrats say, you know what? I like what these Muslims yeah. are saying. The middle way. <laughs> uh, you, you, you know, you, you don't have to uh, get in bed with uh, a, a party that I would argue, some would disagree, is essentially a party of white nationalists, even though it has a lot of support from African Americans. You don't have to ac accept that just to have uh, healthy family values. Yeah, that's what's so And you don't have to wave a rainbow flag to, to be serious about ecological issues. That there is a third way. And as Muslims, we have to begin to articulate that third way confidently, believing in ourselves. And I, I think it would be amazing what would happen if we do that. And then, so that's domestic and then internationally, we began to, uh, as a community, enter into dialogue with foreign Muslim pow uh, powers, as opposed to Part of the community is, is aligned with Qatar, formally. When Qatar was against the UAE, Qatar beef was going on. And part of the community is aligned with the UAE. And now we're fighting each other on issues that have absolutely nothing to do with us. That we say, no, we're, we're going to uh, offer the resources of our community to help both of you accomplish some of the goals you want to accomplish in the United States based on our terms. So we, we have to mature and, and start to think beyond the parameters that have been laid out for us. Allah give us tawfiq. They see it. I don't know if we can. Yeah, we'll take it. Assalamu so my question is for teenagers, I guess high school to college, where these ideologies that are being presented are seemed, you know, to be very empathetic and merciful, and it's inherently good. Un just until you disagree. Until you disagree. What tools do you think are best? When, 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 when the African American community here in California was. Uh, Blame for the defeat of Proposition 8, the Gay Marriage Amendment, which became irrelevant when the, the constitutional change. You had the merciful kumbaya, we're just innocent victims of historical oppression and marginalization, spitting on 
brothers and sisters in San Francisco and LA. So it's merciful to you disagree. Anyway, what was your question? Um, I agree. Um, <laughs> it got lost in the shuffle. My question is, for people that age, you know, Muslims on the edge, or even Muslims that are strong in the fundamentals, what tools do you think are best to introduce alternatives? Is it aqidah? Is it sharia? Is it sunnah? Is it hadith? Is it Quran? What tools can you use to introduce, I mean, I know it's cliche, wholesome, angelic ways of living rather than satanic, hedonistic ways of living? The foundation is aqidah. That's right. Generally speaking, you don't, you don't find those strong East Coast African-American Salafi communities contemplating putting a rainbow flag on the masjid. It's not happening. Because they, they hammer, Akira, Akira, Akira. That's the found our beliefs. And anything contrary to the belief is not acceptable. So uh, Akira is definitely important. But at the end of the day, it's just having faith and confidence. Because you can have all the Akira in the world. If you don't have faith and belief in yourself and, and confidence that Islam has something positive to offer the world, starting with this country, then you're just setting yourself up to be sucked in by either, either we're calling to this way or we're being called to someone else's way. There's no middle ground. Allah give us tawfiq, tashir, and kabul. So it's that old time religion. Like the old lady who was reputed to have said, someone said, oh, there's the great alam, Fakhruddin al-Razi. He has a hundred proofs for the existence of God. And she just scoffed and, supposedly, scoffed and said, well, if he didn't have a hundred doubts, he wouldn't need a hundred proofs. The belief of the old ladies. We need some of that old lady belief. Some of that old time religion. And, 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 and then we'll be on the... I mean, I was, ter I was terrible in grad school. I was like... I, I look back on it. Professor probably thought I was crazy. But we're like, no, Islam challenges that idea. We're like on the war path. And so we have to be aggressive, we have to believe in ourselves, we, we have to have confidence, and we have to believe in the depths of our soul that this uh, way of life that has saved me, given me direction, spared me a lot of the hardships that so many people are wrestling with, that there are a lot of other people out there it could do the same thing for. Allah give us tawfiq. So I think that was the last question. Dua and dhikr. Ala bi dhikr illahi tatmin salawat. Audhu billahi mina shaytan ni rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusallun ala nabi. يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيد محمد وآل وسلم 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 اللهم صل على Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Alihi wa sallam 
Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآل محمد وسلم 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 اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآل محمد وآل محمد وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا 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 محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم اجعل جمعنا هذا جمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعد تفرق معصوما ولا تدع عندنا ولا فينا ولا معنا شاقيا ولا محروما اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول ما تحول به بيننا وبين معاصيك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا بها جنتك ومن اليقين ما يهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا بأسماءنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرا على من ظالمنا وانصرنا على من عدانا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا 
ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك ولا يرحمنا يا أرحم الراحمين وعفو عنا وفي لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا للقوم الكافرين اللهم إن اللهم إن نسلك نسألك الحدا والتوقع والغنى والأفف والمغفرة يا الله we're standing here at the doors and the gates of your mercy in the month of Shaban eagerly anticipating Ramadan bless us to take advantage of these days يا الله to begin fasting to begin uh, engaging with the book of Allah more than we might have engaged during the months that preceded this month of Shaban يا الله Bless us to start fasting. Bless us to engage with the Book of Allah. Bless us to prepare ourselves for the entrance of the month, the blessed month of Ramadan. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we ask you that you guide everyone and bring everyone who has come here to the gathering safely back to their residence, to their places of repose. Ya Allah, bring them safely back to their families. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we ask you that you protect everyone, that you uplift and inspire everyone that you bless us to come together, Ya Allah, as one unified community with our distinctions for sure, as the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has its distinctions, but ultimately as one army marching in one direction towards one goal, and that is the service and the elevation of the word of truth, the word of truth, the word of Tawheed in this world, Ya Allah, and to help people to find life through the life-giving message of Islam, Ya Allah. Bless us to be strong and steadfast, Ya Allah. Bless us to be merciful in the many, many situations that call for mercy. Bless us to be strong and firm in the many, many situations that call for strength and firmness. Bless us to be compassionate and understanding in those situations that call for compassion and understanding, Ya Allah. Allah, spare us and drive ignorance away from us. Bless us to be qualified and known as people of knowledge, people of integrity, people of dignity, people with a solid commitment to you, Ya Allah, and a love for you, Ya Allah, and a love for your Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and a love for the Sharia, Ya Allah, and a love for the ethical system of Islam, a love that's predicated at every level, our love for you, our love of the Messenger, our love for the 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 mor the morals and morality a love for the beliefs that is all predicated on the beauty that exists in all of those ya allah your beauty ya allah in allah jamil yahibbul jamal allah is beautiful may we recognize your beauty ya allah and the beauty of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the beauty of our moral system and moral code ya allah and the beauty of the general teachings of the religion ya allah the beauty of the law ya allah when we, you bless us to understand, to embrace, and to love all of that, Ya Allah, the love for your people, Ya Allah, to call the people of this Ummah Da'wah, the Ummah, the wider Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the way of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَمَنْ أَحْسِنْ وَقَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمَلَ الصَّالِحَا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And who is best in speech, better in speech than one who calls to Allah and does righteous deeds and says, Proudly, verily, I am amongst the Muslims. Bless us to be those who call to your way, Ya Allah. Bless us to be those whose deeds are righteous and pious, Ya Allah. Bless us to be proud to say, La ilaha illallah, to be proud to say that we are Muslims, Ya Allah. Not an arrogant, vainglorious pride, but a pride that's, that's rooted in the happiness and the joy of knowing that we're undertaking an affair that's beloved to you, that we've been commissioned with by you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, bless this community, strengthen this community, Bless its leadership, Ya Allah. Bless the, all of the people who support this community, who benefit from all of the services that are offered here, Ya Allah. We ask you this and intercede with you through the righteous deeds that were undertaken by everyone, every believing soul on the face of this earth in the preceding day of Jumu'ah, Ya Allah. 
from prayer and from uh, from from reciting the Quran, from traveling great distances in some uh, instances to re to attend the Juma prayer, whatever acts of good of dhikr and fikr, whatever it might be, Ya Allah, we intercede with you, to you through that, Ya Allah, that you accept our prayer, that you accept our prayer, that you accept our prayer. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam al-fatiha. Yeah. <laughs>